Good morning, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this uh, logistics webinar around uh, the ocean markets and uh, our predictions for 2021. My name is Andrew Schultz. I'm the global head of ocean freight here in, at Flexport, and I'm super, I'm super excited to spend the next uh, one hour with all of you. We have um, several uh, thousand people dialing in, uh, so a lot of um, a lot of opportunity uh, to get feedback from all of you, and a lot of opportunity to provide you with the latest and, and greatest insights right here. Um, in front of you, uh, you have a few different uh, uh, screens. First off, in the middle, you see the slide deck. That's basically the content that we'll cover uh, throughout the next uh, hour. You have an opportunity to enlarge the slide deck by dragging uh, the, the small arrow in the lower right corner or uh, the window you see in the top right corner. Then below the screen, you see a few widgets, uh, one of them being a Q&A button where you can basically submit any questions. We have logistics experts uh, right here that can answer any questions instantly. Um, and then uh, we also have a Q&A session at the very end of the, the webinar. You also find a small bio uh, with each of the speakers that I'll introduce you uh, to in a minute. And then you also have the opportunity to download uh, the slide deck uh, from this presentation. Again, if you have any practical questions around any of these technicalities, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A box, and we're there to, uh, to assist you. Before we, uh, we go into, uh, into the content, uh, a brief disclaimer right here. Um, we all know that the, uh, the state of the ocean nation is pretty much changing every minute, every hour. So what we're presenting to you today is the current snapshot. Uh, so please don't hold us accountable for any outdated information over the coming days or weeks as the situation continues to, uh, to change. Um, this webinar uh, may also not address all of your uh, tailor-made needs, but again, feel free to, uh, to ask any questions in the Q&A box or uh, reach out to any of us uh, subsequently. We're happy to engage. Um, I'm super excited to present you with uh, my, my co-speakers here today. Uh, first off, uh, Lars Jensen, welcome to you, Lars. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. Lars is uh, the CEO of Sea Intelligence, uh, which is basically his own company that he's been running for the past decade or so. Before that, uh, Lars had uh, 10 years of experience uh, in various companies such as uh, Maersk. And Lars has basically been in this uh, ocean uh, game for the past uh, more than 20 years. So he knows a lot about ocean freight and basically can answer any questions I should say, at least uh, he'd like to try. Uh, Nerius uh, Poskos uh, is the second speaker today. Nerius is VP of Ocean Freight uh, here at Flexport and has basically been uh, building the ocean freight here at Flexport from ground up. Uh, welcome to you, Nerius. Excited to have you. Thanks, Anders, and hi, everybody. All right, let's uh, let's dive in. As you can see right here, we have quite the meaty topics to, to cover today. Um, we'll start out with a, a quick recap of 2020. We know it was a, a tough year in many ways, so uh, by all means, let's not spend too much time on 2020. Nevertheless, let's recap sort of the highlights of 2020 that has also sort of uh, been been um, been sort of reflected in the first uh, in the first part of 2021. Um, then we'll look into um, equipment, uh, basically the situation of container boxes. Nearly famously cited equipment as being sort of the gold of 2020. Uh, we'll have a discussion around predictions for 2021. Will it remain the gold or will we see a change here? Then we'll look into Chinese New Year. We all know that Chinese New Year typically tends to slow down things. But what will happen uh, this time around and how do we expect uh, sort of the aftermath of China's New Year in 2021. Then we'll take a look at the contract season. Some of you may signing up uh, parts of your shipments on fixed contracts. Um, we'll take a look at uh, the prediction for the contract season, and then we'll also come up with the uh, recommendations and solutions before we uh, jump into uh, Q&A. So with that, let's take a look at, uh, at 2020 right here. We have uh, chosen to summarize sort of the, the 2020 situation, at least the second half of 2020, as uh, the so-called vicious uh, ocean uh, market cycle as we see it. If we start in the top right corner here of this uh, spinning wheel, you can see um, that the, the, the supply and demand imbalance has been a thing for pretty much uh, eight straight months now. In essence, we have more demand than supply out there, which has not been the case in history where we've actually had more supply than demand. 
This bundled with labor shortage because of um, social distancing rules, because of COVID contractions and whatnot, has only exacerbated the problem. This is now turning into port congestion issues we've never seen before. In some cases, vessels are waiting 10 to 14 days to offload their cargo in some ports. We'll have a look at some of the mind-blowing uh, um, situations uh, a little bit later on. All of this is translating into uh, more vessel delays that we've ever seen before in this industry. And in return, this is also shortening sort of, um, um, or this is uh, uh, prolonging the time for equipment or container boxes to get all the way back to the origin. Um, for example, Asia, where the container equipment is very much needed to load the cargo. So we've seen sort of this spinning wheel, this vicious cycle pretty much going on for the past eight months or so. We'll look into each of the each of the uh, compounding effects before we predict what's going to happen uh, this year going forward. Um, so as mentioned, um, we are seeing more demand than ever before outstripping uh, the supply out there. Here we've depicted uh, the U.S. container imports uh, over time for the past uh, almost 10 year period. And you can see on the green graph right here that imports into the U.S. are all time high. Less the case for exports on the red graph that is literally dropping like a rock lately. Uh, this is even more clear in, in this snapshot uh, we've shown here, where we basically zoomed in on 2020. You can see that the ratio between import and exports is increasing to a level we've never seen before. It's more than three to one now. And so in short, the trade tariffs, the, the trade wars are not really doing the trick. It's actually the other way around. Imports are skyrocketing and exports are dropping like a rock. Lars, help us uh, understand what's driving this. Why is this happening? It is exceedingly simple. Social distancing, closure of uh, entertainment, the inability to travel means people get stuck at home and they buy stuff. It is as simple as that. Early on, you could see skyrocketing of especially stuff to equip your home offices. That then was expanded to other stuff to improve your home and garden and what have you. It's as simple as that. People spend less money, but the money they do spend, they reallocate away from services and onto goods. Interesting. Lars, is that also the, the situation into, uh, into, into Europe? Uh, right here, we see the, the, the Europe development in terms of imports and export. It's somewhat of a different story, yet uh, yet a little bit different. Help uh, help us understand what we're seeing here relative to the U.S. situation. Exactly. It, it, it's a little bit different, but still the same. Um, first of all, the pickup in Europe started a couple of months later than what we saw in the U.S., but it was the same phenomenon. Secondly, the U.S. consumer apparently isn't as gung-ho in terms of sitting at home and buying stuff as the U.S. consumer. So what we're seeing in Europe is by and large the same pattern, but it's slightly delayed and somewhat more subdued compared to what we see in North America. Lars, on the other chart, we had data up until December. This stops in, in November. How would you expect the European import uh, graph to, to develop in December and January? It, it, it's going up. I mean, we don't have firm data yet, but it appears that the Asia-Europe trade is likely going to be up some 13% in December, which is higher, and I would expect January to grow as well. Then, of course, we get to the Chinese New Year impact, but I know we're going to cover that later today. Okay. And, and Lars, has this something to do with the inventory levels being low and, and, and shippers uh, restocking? How, how do you see that? That, that is a compounding effect. When uh, the pandemic hit, we actually had very low inventories. Uh, so when consumers suddenly started buying, inventories were running short quickly. That boosts demand, obviously. And this, this gives a different play out compared to the financial crisis a bit over a decade ago, which we started with actually extremely high inventories. This time around is different. So there is a compounding effect of the inventories on top because they were low to start with. Got it. Very clear. And on that note, we, we would love to um, to understand from all of you attending this webinar how you see um, sort of your, your inventory levels compared to your desired inventory levels. Um, we have uh, thousands of shippers attending, so quite the sample size to get a good feel for, for, for how everyone sees it. So 
would love if you wouldn't mind taking sort of the next 30 uh, seconds or so to select one of the four uh, options here. Um, so in short, are your inventory levels uh, right where you want them to be? Less than 50% of desired uh, levels, greater than 50%, or do you basically have too much inventory uh, at hand? All right, let's see the results. Um, last chance to drop your, your vote. Great. All right. Nerys, what are we seeing here? Is this, a, is this yeah. a surprise? It's not a surprise. Uh, about half of the people answered that they have less than 50% of desired inventory levels, which, is, which explains basically why a lot of things in US and I assume Europe as well, they're simply out of stock, right? You can't buy things and get them delivered in many cases this week. In some cases, we have to wait for months. Uh, so this is actually not surprising. It is a little bit surprising that some people actually have more inventory than uh, than expected, about 23% or so. How about you, Lars? Are you surprised by these? Uh results no I'm, 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 not, I'm not overly surprised either and i'm not surprised that you have some here that have greater inventory than necessary because part of what of course have happened is when people start to buy online you might change your preferences slightly in terms of what it is you buy and that means that some of the inventory that the importers had especially prior to the pandemic might have turned out to be goods that people didn't necessarily want makes sense Okay, let's um, let's pivot to the the, the supply situation um, and, uh, and and what that looks like. So um, earlier in in twenty twenty in the first half of twenty twenty, we saw a lot of news out there about carriers blanking uh, sailings, basically taking capacity out at record high levels. But what you can see here on the on the green uh, line is that um, that has actually reduced significantly. And carriers are actually uh, deploying more capacity in terms of ships than ever before. The red line here shows uh, capacity deployed year over year. And as you could see at sort of the far uh, right, uh, it's literally off the chart. Carriers are deploying quite a lot of capacity at the moment, at least when we talk about ships. Help us understand uh, this, Lars. Uh, if this is happening, why are we still having sort of uh, uh, more demand than supply? Well, again, part of it is there's a physical limit as to how much you can ship. But I, I think we should break it down into two parts because early on, as we can see, there was a raft of blank sailings. So capacity was down. That was used by the carriers to prevent a market collapse when there was no demand. When you got into second half, blank sailings first went to zero. And if you are observant on the graph, you will see there's actually now an increase in blank sailings, which offhand sounds counterintuitive. Why would carriers blank sailings in the midst of a capacity crisis? There are two things to it. First of all, the sailings that are blank right now, operationally, the carriers have no choice. I mean, when you have all the vessels stuck waiting outside ports, they cannot make the return journey. So they can't actually start the sailing they were supposed to do. So operationally, there's no choice. The blank sailings now are not by choice. They are by operational necessity. Secondly, there's also a bit of a myth that a blank sailing means a reduction in capacity. Whereas we can clearly see here, we have an increase in capacity. It is true that there are individual sailings which are blanked, but in terms of capacity in the market, they are more than compensated for by extra loaders and the phase in of larger vessels. Interesting. Let's, uh, on that note, zoom in at the port situation, because you mentioned that that's, uh, that's quite tough at the moment with all the congestion. So, so let's take a look at, uh, at, at, at two of the biggest uh, ports out there, the port of uh, uh, Long Beach in, in, in Los Angeles and uh, the port of Rotterdam in, in Europe. What we see on the left side here is, is a situation where um, the port of LA is, is currently having more than, than 100 ships in port, and a third of them is literally waiting outside to be able to berth to then discharge the cargo. On top of that, we're seeing um, COVID uh, cases. Um, we're also um, 
seeing a lot of our challenges. Nearest, help us understand the, the, the current situation here. Yeah, this is definitely, it's quite tough out there in the ports. Uh, indeed, as you mentioned, there are, there were a few days ago, 112 ships in the, the port of Los Angeles and Long Beach waiting, which was another record. And 33 of them were waiting uh, to get, actually there were 112 ports, ships at the port, including the ones that are waiting. And 33 of them were waiting for, for the berth. Uh, for the Mara, for example, you have stormy conditions. Like last night, uh, the seas were really high, the winds were very high, and many scheduled movements did not happen as, uh, as scheduled. So the, the conditions are actually getting worse. So why is this happening? One is volume. Like Lars mentioned, at the beginning of the year, there were a lot of blank sailings, and the port of Los Angeles imports plunged nearly 19%. But the second half, they actually rose nearly 50% year over year. So, and what happened is you basically now have almost, and that was last week, 300,000 TUs waiting to get offloaded. That's a lot of cargo. Two, now you, have, you need staff and also infrastructure, right, to offload everything. So while, let's leave infrastructure aside for a minute. The second one is staff, right? People at the port have a lot of coronavirus cases. Last week alone, there were about 700 COVID-19 cases amongst, I think, up something like 9,000 ILWU employees. So that's a very high percentage of COVID cases, right? So a lot of people are out. Uh, so they can't service uh, the ships fast enough, which led to waiting times increased up to 10, 14 days, and in some cases, even more, depending on the terminals. So port executives, union leaders, and uh, elected officials launched uh, a campaign to initiate the dock worker vaccinations because what they're actually fearing is that uh, that the terminals may even be shut down if the conditions get worse. I, I don't think we're there yet, but again, if the conditions get worse, it may happen. Uh, third, what's happening is typically at this time of the year, you would have some uh, or more blank sailings like of course, January is still a very busy month, but right about February, you have a, a lot of blank sailings, uh, pre-Chinese New Year. So to give some stats, last year we had 88 blank sailings uh, at this time of the year. Two years ago, it was something like 65, 67. This year, we only have seven on Asia Europe and five on the Trans-Pacific. And like Lars mentioned, many of them are not by choice. There will be more of them, again, because of the, the issues. But anyway, so the, the volumes are very high. And it's not only that they're high, they're continuously high. And they will continue being high for the weeks to come. So the port will not have time to clean up the mess post-Chinese New Year. What you're seeing on the right is Rotterdam. There is some congestion, uh, but much less. There are a few reasons why. One is the ships that are calling European ports, specifically Asia Europe, are much larger, in many cases 20,000 TUs or so. And two, the port of Rotterdam is uh, much more automated. So the staff, uh, like in the US, a lot of staff is affected with coronavirus. Uh, in Europe, you're not necessarily seeing that. Yeah, if I can just uh, add uh, a, a little comment on that, because all the vessels you're showing there that, that, that has the waiting time, if you sit down and say, what does that actually mean? This is the equivalent of pulling five full Trans-Pacific services permanently out of action, as long as uh, you have these waiting times. So the impact is massive. The second part is on the blank sailings, because up until a few days ago, it was very clear that the carriers all had the intention of not blanking anything after Chinese New Year to clean up the mess. Then a couple of days ago, there was the announcement from THE Alliance. They are now blanking it's either 21 or 23 Trans-Pacific services in February. Not because they want to, but the picture you have there explains exactly why they have to, in order to get their vessels back on track and, and regain some sort of operational normality, they have no choice. Now, it sounds a lot with 20-odd blank sailings. In a normal seasonal context, this is not out of the ordinary. This is what we usually would expect from an alliance in Chinese New Year, but the problem was, up until a few days ago, the expectation was not really any blank sailings in order to help the bottlenecks. 
So what you're saying in some laws is under normal circumstances, uh, the carriers would idle the ships and basically hold them empty. Right now, they're waiting uh, quite full, but essentially it's having more or less the same impact to the overall uh, supply chain. Yes, and under normal circumstances, nobody should be worried about 20-odd blank sailings from an alliance after Chinese New Year, but this is not normal circumstances. Mm -hmm. Got it. On that note, let's um, let's move on from uh, the ports themselves to um, to the logistics after uh, the ships have discharged, uh, because we're also seeing uh, quite uh, quite some challenges there in terms of uh, chassis availability. Nereus, uh, what what are some of the stats we're looking at here? Yeah, so what we're seeing here is that. In many, many cases, in many ports in the U.S., the terminals, I should say, we are actually running out of chassis. While this graph shows you that uh, roughly 80% of chassis is being utilized at any moment, uh, we have to remember that about 13% of chassis are out of service at any moment. It could be due to service uh, or any other things. The thing and thing is there are many owners, right? There is no one owner owning all the chassis similar to the shipping lines, right? They own their containers in most cases. So are they at the right place? Because of many owners, it could be that some of the chassis are available, but they are available at the wrong terminal and at the wrong time. So kind of similar to, uh, to containers. The third is uh, the utilization is... Uh, again, across the market. So it also covers the whole United States. So it could be that sometimes you have some chassis available uh, in one place, but not available in another one. You also have to remember that many chassis are actually being held for particular vessels or clients. And while in inventory, general truckers cannot access them. So for example, premium services, right? There are quite a few new premium services launched in the market in 2020 by be it Metson, CMA, Zim, all of them actually launched, in addition to what they had in the past, new services. Now, many of those come with chassis guarantee. Those guarantees actually eliminate some of the chassis from the market because, again, they are guaranteed, so they have to have more of them. So what we're essentially what we're seeing here is that we are out of chassis, uh, and it slows things down. In Europe, I think it's important and interesting to mention we are not necessarily seeing the same thing. And the reason is quite simple. Chassis are typically owned by the truckers. Uh, and when you book a trip with them, they provide you with a truck and wheels or chassis. In the United States, it's not the case, which is why we're seeing this mess. Interesting. Do you think that's going to increase the amount of premium services out there to try and sort of attack this problem? Indeed, I think the issues are compounding, right? If, if you have a lack of containers or lack of chassis, and if you have premium services, it's almost essentially like an auction. If you pay more, you get it. So everybody who doesn't pay, they don't get it. So yes, I think as long as the current market conditions continue, uh, the premium demand will increase, absolutely. Got it. Okay, let's um, let's move on um, to overall global schedule reliability. Um, all of the compounding uh, effects we've been sort of covering in this in this vicious cycle that we've seen lately is is boiling down to a record low global schedule reliability, uh, which basically hit uh, as low as fifty percent in the month of uh, November. You see the stats for for the prior years. Um, um, in, in, in the other graphs. This is only covering um, port to port uh, st stats. Um, and even so, I mean, 50% global schedule reliability. I mean, how can that be sustainable? I mean, we, we don't see that in many other industries. Uh, last, how do you sort of forecast this global schedule reliability in, in the coming months and years and, and what to expect out there? Yeah, for, to, first to say the, the positive thing is this 50%, that is a rosy picture for many shippers. The reality they experience is considerably worse because this just measures whether the main vessels arrive on time, whether you then get it delivered on time at final destination. A rule of thumb is that's 10 percentage points below what these graphs indicate 
On top of that, this is, of course, when you measure whether a vessel is on time, it requires the vessel to sail in the first place, which means blank sailings are not even included. Cargo that is not being loaded because it's being rolled also compounds to this effect. So the reality on the ground is actually a lot worse than what this graph shows. And all of this again boils down to this is not by choice of the carriers. We have already discussed all the operational bottlenecks in the system, including the problems with the ports. And until those get fixed, it's hard to get schedule reliability back on track. It appears the carrier's plans for now in the coming months is to use the post-Chinese New Year period to get their vessels back on track and back on schedule. If that works out, and if, and that's a big if, we get the port congestion sorted out, we could start to get back up to more normal levels within a few months. But that's the optimistic view. So what's your best guess um, in, a, in a year from now, Lars? What, what's the percentage no, we're seeing? Yeah, but, but, but a year from now, we're going to be back to normal operations. And for normal operations, like you also see in the past few years, we're going to end up again between the 70 and 75 percent. Uh, I, I do not have any expectation that the industry will start, suddenly start run at 95 percent. Uh, this is, again, the global average. It varies from trade lane to trade lane. But by and large, if you look over the last 10 years, what you have seen is schedule reliability hasn't really improved or degraded. The main thing that has happened is performance across the carriers have become more uniform. To me, that signals, and I know there's a lot of shippers that don't like to hear this, but at the end of the day, it's a trade-off between what does it cost to run on time where you need to speed up vessels and what's the willingness to pay. I don't have any expectation that that will necessarily change dramatically going forward. And again, mind you, this is for global average. You do have trade lanes where the average is consistently much higher. You have trade lanes where it's consistently much lower. But a structural systematic change, I don't see that in the cards. Got it. Okay. Thanks, Lars. Okay, let's pivot to um, the equipment situation. Um, Nereus, you, you, you cited equipment as being sort of the, the goal of, of 2020. Uh, I, would, uh, I would love to sort of hear your, your predictions for, for 2021. Do you still expect it to be the goal? Uh, do you want to downgrade it to, to silver or another metal? What, what, what's your prediction there? Yeah, I definitely should have bought all the container manufacturer stocks when the time was right. Like some of them are two, three X higher now than they were six months ago. Like, eh. Uh, so I do expect this to continue. Question is for how long, right? So it's already 2021. Equipment issues are still very big in Asia. Like, again, question is how long this is going to last into the 2021. So let's look at some fundamentals. The one equipment is prioritized for better paying trade lanes or premium products. So expect that to continue as long as equipment globally is tight. And it doesn't mean we have no containers. Containers are simply in the wrong places, right? So if they are in the wrong places and if there is more supply at the specific port of loading, then demand, uh, then there is no issue. If it's vice versa, all of a sudden there is an issue. Carriers have to prioritize. And when they prioritize, again, they prioritize different trade lanes, premium products. What is a different trade lane for those who don't know? Let's say a Trans Pacific journey on a carrier pays whatever, 50 cents a mile, and then Asia Europe lane pays a dollar a mile, as an example. Uh, the carriers will, of course, if they can, prioritize loading to Europe rather than the US. And this is actually what we have seen. European prices were too low in 220, uh, or Asia Europe prices were too low, and Trans Pacific prices were high. So, equipment availability, so to speak, was better for Trans Pacific trade lane. Now it's the opposite. The Asia Europe prices are high. We're going to get into that discussion soon. Another thing it's important to remember is new containers are actually being delivered all the time. The shipping lines ordered quite a bit of them at the second half of 220. Now, are they delivered at the right places? Yes, they are because the shortage is global, but it doesn't cover the whole world, especially it doesn't cover the outports. So if you talk about Wuhu, Wuhan or Guangzhou province or whatever, everywhere outside of the main ports, I think the equipment is even more tight. 
Uh, and it, again, it varies by carrier. It could be that one carrier has equipment, another carrier has completely no equipment. So I think that will continue at least in the first half of 2021. The second half, uh, I maybe leave it up to Lars. So to me, again, we have to just remember it is, it is still tight. Question is how long it's going to stay tight. And the last thing I actually wanted to say here is we also have to remember that today containers and vessels are moving slower. And that is a major issue. It's kind of a blank sailing, right? A blank sailing reduces capacity from the market. If containers and vessels are moving slower, that reduces, again, the global availability. And why are they moving slower is we have discussed this already. Right? The ports are congested. Uh, we have labor issues at the ports. There's no chassis. There is no not enough vessels. All of these things uh, are adding up, which is why uh, equipment, again, globally is moving slower. So until that is resolved, equipment will remain the gold. Uh, again, question is for how much. My personal guess would be about the second half of the year con uh, conditions should improve. But I would like to hear from my, Lars on uh, his predictions here. My, my, my quick answer to that question is no. It will definitely not remain gold. A uh, couple of reasons for this one. First of all, uh, for those uh, who have been in the industry long enough, we saw exactly the same scenario play out in 2010 to the T of what we see now. That was the comeback after the financial crisis, where we also had equipment shortages for exactly the same reasons as we have them now. At that point in time, there was a massive ordering spree of containers. Obviously, you needed to alleviate it. And then we ended up with overcapacity on the container side. We're going to see a replay of it. Another way to look at it is in 2020 globally, we're going to move basically the same amount of containers as we did in 2019. We sure did have enough containers in 2019. The only reason we didn't have enough in 20 is because everybody insisted on moving it in Q4 instead of Q2. We have not seen the, the only other thing that could change the need for equipment is if we suddenly saw a massive rearrangement on TEU miles. If sourcing patterns change dramatically, but they haven't, it's just the timing of it. So there's absolutely nothing in the data for 2021 indicating that we would have insufficient equipment. Actually, there's a building spree of equipment. If you look at the timing for 2010, it took about three months from the problem really arose until it was resolved. If we put that in the same context now, that basically means this should be resolved by Chinese New Year. The wild card this time around is the port congestion, because that ties mm -hmm. up a significant part of the ability to reposition the empty containers and bring the flow back into balance. That could delay it somewhat. But once this gets alleviated, it's not going to remain gold for very long. I would basically have the view that this is going to be resolved, again, with the wild card of the port congestion much sooner than summer. So it sounds like, I mean, lots of nuances here, right? Um, depends on, on the given ports. Some feeder ports uh, may be more challenged than others. But let's say, you know, if, if, I, if I'm a shipper from, say, Shanghai to LA or Rotterdam, uh, when am I sort of in the clear in terms of getting 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 that equipment, that, that container box? Uh, is it one month from now, two, three? What's sort of the best guess out there? Lars, let's start with you. No, I mean, if, if I was that shipper, I would still sit with a, let's call it a hope, because it's not a main case scenario, but have a hope that this would actually be at a situation where I would feel more comfortable with it already in a month. And I would have a reasonable expectation that this will not be a problem in two months. That doesn't mean you're going to see equipment, empty equipment in the abundance everywhere, but it brings you away from the situations where it's patently impossible in some places. Got it. Neris, would you agree? I'm, you I'm a little on? bit less optimistic than Lars. Uh, I do agree it's not going to... And it's unlikely to last into the second half of 221, but I think it will last at least two, three, maybe even four months. Kind of what Lars already mentioned, because of the congestion, it is getting much worse at the ports like Los Angeles with 33 vessels waiting, and maybe 50 vessels waiting in a few weeks, right, with all these uh, additional loaders also coming to the U.S. So that equipment is not coming back to Asia on time. Uh, so my my prediction is it's going to last a few months longer than that. 
ju just to throw yeah. in a wild card, okay. and okay. I know we're going to discuss it later today, but just one comment. One thing, I mean, if this drags on for a while, the one thing that's going to save the equipment situation is when we get to the point in 21 where demand growth turns negative again. Yeah. Okay, good insight. Uh, on that note, let's uh, let's turn to the next um, the next topic: rates. Um, of course, I mean all the compounding effects we've talked about is translating into higher freight rates than we've ever seen before. I mean, this this chart speaks for itself. It almost looks like a Bitcoin chart right here, with rates uh, basically exploding uh, in 2020. Um, what to expect here going forward, uh, Lars? We have seen a few adjustments here and there for some lanes. Is this massive wave going to break uh, anytime soon? What, what do you think? At, at least my take on the market right now is it appears that we, are, we have reached the plateau. Uh, I don't expect the rates to come down sharply within the next few days, but I think we've reached the plateau and within a few weeks on the other side of Chinese New Year, we're going to see some of these rates come down relatively quickly. That does not mean you're going to see rates collapse. Absolutely not. But they're going to come down to more, let's call them normal and reasonable levels. Nerys, how do you see this? A few points. <clears throat> Sorry. Well, one is this graph actually doesn't show the premiums that often reach thousands of dollars, two, three, even four thousand dollars to actually get equipment or get priority to get loaded. So the actual situation is, is much worse. I do agree with Lars that the, the prices should come down. Uh, I think they will flatten uh, post Chinese New Year. I don't think they will come back to 2019 levels by any means quickly. Uh, it, they may, but I don't think that's going to happen in the next two, three months. But the trend should be downwards, right? Just remember that it's not going to go down from, <clears throat> sorry, three, four, four, five thousand dollars in Los Angeles. It's actually five, six, seven thousand dollars, and that's going to get down. So at first, you won't need to be the premiums to get equipment, and then the prices will slowly start declining. I also think that this will impact contract negotiations in 221 simply because how high the spot prices are, right? Like you have to remember the contracted rates are three, five times higher, or oh, sorry, lower than today's FAK rates. So that's a big insight. Uh, the timing is in carrier's favor, right? Negotiating contracts when spot market is so high is, is good for them. And last thing people aren't talking about, but DAF prices, so fuel prices, the low so for fuel prices are actually going up at this time. Of course, relatively to $9,000 per container, Shanghai to Rotterdam is nothing, but the carrier costs are silently going up. It's not a lot, but it, it, it is going up. So we, that will impact future pricing slightly. One, one, a, a couple of additional comments I just want to throw in there. I mean, you were mentioning the contract rates. Uh, that's a slightly different game. You haven't seen them explode to the same degree, but they're coming up rapidly over the last few weeks. But if we look at this slightly more in context for the contract rates, most contract rates took a nosedive to a different level back in 2016 when the markets crashed. And the carriers have essentially tried but been fairly unable to increase contract rates back up ever since then. It seems highly likely that 2021 is the year where they will actually succeed in doing that. If they do bring the contract rates back up to the level that was normal pre the market crash in 2016, in very round numbers, what you're looking at is 70% increases on your contracts on Transpac, 50% increases on Asia Europe, for example. Interesting. What about the floating market, uh, Lars? It's been of course, with some degree of volatility, it's been somewhat stable in the past. What sort of the new average uh, level going forward? Uh, no, is yeah, it I mean, for, for, to what we see? For, yeah. for, for the spot rates, if you look over, to, uh, especially 2018, 2019, before we got hit by the pandemic, what you see is a stable, slightly increasing trend. And if you try to examine what was going on back then, this was actually when the carriers began to experiment with blank sailings. Uh, this is when the alliances found out that they can actually make sure they don't put in too much capacity so they can prevent spot rates from dropping. What I would have an, have an anticipation of is that trend they were working with is basically the long-term structural trend. So you can look at where were the spot rates, what were the increases slowly over time, and basically this is where we're going to head down towards 
for 2021. So we won't, at the end of the day, come down to 2019 levels. We're going to come down to a higher level that was indicated by the increasing trends we already set back in 2018 and 19. Interesting. And on that note, actually, let's uh, let's take a look at this uh, this chart right here, which is quite interesting. Also, sort of showing uh, some of the, the the things Lars is describing right here, where basically carriers have. Uh, and started more alliances and, and uh, embarked on more consolidation to basically make up for historical losses. What you see here is, uh, is a 13-year snapshot of the carrier profitability uh, with the big fat conclusion that on average they haven't gener generated more than 0% return on invested capital um, over the years. That's obviously changing uh, as of lately with, with the, with the, with the um, rate levels jumping. Um, and now the, the carrier profitability is hovering around the 15%-ish or so. Last, what to expect going forward? Uh, will they get, get, get back into negative uh, profit territories? Will the current profitability level remain? Will it even increase? What do you, what do you think? Yeah, the current profitability levels, especially what do you, what we would expect for Q4, is going to be almost off the charts. I mean, if you don't make a fantastic amount of money as a carrier in Q4, you're doing something wrong. But the graph is interesting because if you look at the last large spike you have there, that is precisely the rebound after the financial crisis where we had the same bottleneck effects as we see now. You can also see how quickly it came down. What's going to be different this time is after the rebound last time, the carriers launched into a year-long vicious price war where they fought over market share and volume, which set the tone for all those losses. That seemed highly unlikely to happen this time around. You're going to see a spike in profitability, and then you're going to come down, but not to negative territory, to a more sustainable level. Uh, an another thing to keep in mind is, it, from a mathematical perspective, it's of course true that you can say, well, the carrier has lost money over time, so now somebody else has to pay. As a shipper, that argument doesn't fly very much. I mean, I might have been a shipper that's only been in the game for the last couple of years. Why should I pay for a price war the carriers themselves instituted 10 years ago? So, so that, that there's going to be quite a bit of tension between the carriers and shippers in the contract negotiations here in 2021. Because at the end of the day, all the bottlenecks and all the supply chain problems we have right now, that can be laid at the foot of the pandemic. Um, as far as I see it, all supply chain stakeholders have actually made very sound decisions operationally in how to handle this. Commercially, of course, it's the carrier's choice what kind of pricing strategy do they want to pursue? They have chosen one where they are looking to maximize their own profitability, which is perfectly fair in any market, but it comes at a price. In this case, a price in terms of some freight ten uh, and some tension in the relationship with their customers. Got it. On that note, um, talking about freight rates and, and freight uh, spend, um, we would love to learn from uh, from all of you out there um, what your 2021 uh, freight budget is relative to your your spend last year. So take uh, take 30 seconds to uh, to select any of the the five options here, uh, so we can learn how you all see it. Uh, do you expect your freight uh, to go up 25 percent or more relative to last year? 25 to 50 percent more, 50 or more percent. Um, or same as last year, and then finally, uh, do you expect to to spend less than than last year? Um, that's going to be quite interesting to see uh, to see how that poll pans out. Quite quite the time to uh, make budgets in the, in this uh, in this volatile market. But uh, let's see. Interesting. Forty percent uh, or more expect. 25 to 50 percent more. Um, Lars, what would you do if you were a shipper? How much more would you budget this year relative to I, last year? Same or? I, I, I would not ask this question. I would ask the question: What would my freight spend be in Q4 21 versus Q4 20? I would take it quarter by quarter because of the extreme volatility. But that aside. I would probably also have put this in at least the 25 to 50, if not 50 plus uh, percent or more, because again of the roller coaster ride we're going to be in for. Got it. Marius, how do you see it? 
Yeah. You know, I agree with Lars, and I would also say this is based on budget. So most of the companies in 220 spend way, way above the budget. They didn't plan to pay $8,000 or $9,000 a container from Shanghai to Rotterdam, but they ended up paying it. So of course they expect to pay more this year. It doesn't mean they will actually spend more money than they actually spent in 220, especially there were if, if, if the importers were shipping a lot on the spot market, which was extremely high. So I think it kind of depends, and we're going to discuss this in the next few slides. But no, this doesn't surprise me and I think indeed there is a reason why 90% of uh, participants said they will pay more from 1 to 50%. All right, that takes us uh, into the next topic. Uh, what will happen um, after Chinese New Year? We all know that Chinese New Year is typically a slowdown and then typically um, after Chinese New Year, uh, things will also slow down to some extent. What's going to happen this time around? Let's start with you, Lars. How do you see? Uh, how, how do you see this panning out? What? How I see this panning out is. Uh, let me bring in a term here: a water hammer. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, bear with me at least just for 30 seconds. Imagine, say, a two-kilometer long pipeline with lots of water flowing through at high speed. That all works phenomenally well. Suddenly, at the end of the pipeline, somebody shuts the valve rapidly. Now you have two kilometers of moving water bearing down on that valve in an instant. If you are unlucky, that means the entire pipeline will now burst open. Everything will be broken. Uh, that, to some degree, is what we are experiencing right now. If your pipe is strong enough, at least you won't break it. But if you measure the pressure inside, just inside that valve, you see a huge spike initially. Then you turn to negative pressure again as the water is now recoiling backwards. Then it comes again almost like you say a wave movement. This is what we're going to be in for in 2021. Right now we were hit by the water hammer with the extreme boom, Trans-Pacific up 30% year on year in December. What is likely to happen, and this is where the timing after Chinese New Year is extremely murky. Remember when we talked about earlier today, consumers shifted their spending away from services onto goods. That's not because consumers don't like services. It's because they can't buy them. The moment sufficiently many consumers realize there's light at the end of the tunnel, they will shift that spending back onto services. And it might even be likely that they will say, I'm going to go on an extra large vacation, an extra large party. This does not mean that consumption of goods will stop. It absolutely won't but it will go down at least just to, let's call it, normal levels. At the same time, you have two months of floating inventory on the way in for inbound to all the warehouses. They will come into warehouses at a point in time where demand will drop compared to where we are now. The importers, they will say, fine, let's just halt the ordering at the manufacturers over in Asia until we get the inventory situation under control. During that period, that will mean that bookings of container freight out of Asia will drop sharply. It will not be a long thing. It will be a month or two, but it will be that water hammer effect where we get the dip and then we'll come back up to normal. That's why earlier I also said, if we don't get the equipment situation solved in a few months, we're going to be hit by a slight negative spike on the demand growth, and that will help us work through all the kinks. All right, everyone, prepare for the water hammer on that note. Um, we'd love to hear from, from all of you out there um, what you expect. Um, so essentially, um, when do you expect the ocean market to go back to normal? Uh, take, again, another 30 seconds to, to pick one of the four options here. Do you expect it to recover in one to three months, three to six months, more than six months, or basically never? It, uh, I could ask, has it ever been normal to start with? <laughs> not, let's not ruin yeah. the poll here. <laughs> All right, let's see the results. Interesting. Nereus, surprised? No. As I also predict three to six months, uh, that things will, uh, it will take three to six months for the things go, to go back to normal. I think it's closer to three than six, but it will take more than, 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 than a month in my eyes. So not surprised. 
Yeah, I would probably yeah. pick these six months more because, uh, I mean, yeah, I, I agree on the time frame that this is when we're going to have the problems resolved, but that doesn't mean we're back to normal, back to my water hammer example. We're going to go through a period where it dips down and then we're going to come back to normal. So I would pick that on the six plus. Yeah, good point. Yeah, actually, I think for the shippers, the normal is they can get equipment, they can get on a ship and they pay fair price. Fair, uh, for fair the carriers, enough. normal is the full ships. So, yeah, good point, Lars. All right, let's uh, let's turn the page to the the next uh, topic. Uh, so, for the ones of you uh, out there who, who ship any of your goods on fixed contracts, uh, we'll now pivot a little bit to to talk about the uh, the upcoming uh, contract season, in particular on the uh, Trans Pacific uh, eastbound trade. Um, so um, let's uh, let's uh, start out with the the final poll right here, just to get get a feel for what actually means the most to you in terms of priorities. Because at the end of the day, when contracting uh, shipments or shipping in general, it's of course all a matter of like making sure that your priorities are taken care of. Uh, so we would love to learn from from all of you what. Uh, what what you value uh, the highest in terms of these five priorities? Um, you can only select two out of five. I know that's probably uh, asking for for trouble, asking for the impossible, given the importance of all all of these five attributes right here. Nevertheless, if you have to restrain and, and just select two, uh, which ones are the two highest priorities when it comes to managing your supply chain in 2021? Reliability, price, visibility customer service or trains at times please uh, select just two and thank you for spending time on this one i'm actually the culprit of this question it will help me to give you better recommendations for the the contract negotiations based on what people have selected so appreciate your time here definitely all right let's have a look interesting that uh, that's pretty clear um reliability and price are up there surprise areas based on your experience no i was actually expecting that the price will be slightly higher than the reliability so but it's 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 it's, it's they're very 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 close to each other so actually i'm not too surprised with these results but a little bit like i i like to see that people value the reliability as much as they do this time. Uh, probably it's because the reliability in 2020 was so low that uh, people are kind of done with it. <laughs> yeah, kind of understand it. Lars, how do you, uh, how do you see it? Surprised here? I, 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 I would have picked a sixth one, but it might actually be included here because for me, there's one thing that should take overarching priority in 21, that's resilience. Again, back to the volatility in the market, but that might be, I mean, that is my guess here, but some of the respondents here might read resilience as part of reliability, because does reliability mean you want it on time, or does reliability mean that you are sure I can actually ship those 50 boxes a week when that's what I've been promised? Got it. Yeah, no, that's a good, uh, that's a good addition. On that note, let's, uh, let's look at some of the the, the recommendations um, for, for, for the upcoming contract season, um, if we turn to the next one here. So um, we've outlined uh, some, 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 some uh, high level recommendations, but of course the devil is in the detail. Uh, Nereus, do you want to do you want to take us through uh, some of the highlights here? Yeah, indeed. And just for the sake of time, I'm going to try to do this quickly. So one, a lot of you have probably heard that some importers already finalized their contracts in 220 and you are all having this question should i launch my rfp tomorrow am i late already am i going to be out of space if i don't negotiate today remember very few retailers have actually finalized their contracts some of them already signed yes that is true they're also paying based on rumors we're hearing much more than they paid last year but it's a very small percentage of the market so i'm not saying delay your contracts but don't rush and don't panic that you have to sign today. Uh, it's an option, but where you want to be is you want to know where the base importers are 
in terms of price. Let's just say the price is 100 for an argument's sake as an index. And the sweet spot is plus minus five, right, in, in terms of an index. So if you are paying less, you are the lowest paying guy on the ship, you will get bumped when things get bad. If you're overpaying, you will be upset because you're overpaying and your goods may not be competitive. So don't rush, wait for a little bit more larger importers to sign and that will set the baseline. Expect to pay more than last year, uh, of course, especially if you are on the fixed contracts. If you are in spot market, I would say for the full year, not for the first half, but the full year of 221, expect to pay slightly less on the spot market than 220. Again, 220 was quite insane. Um, it's also never been as important as this year to be able to predict the volume that you are going to ship. The MQC divided by 50 or 52 is just not going to cut it anymore. So when you negotiate contracts, try to include allocation ranges, the min, the max. Uh, and remember, the wider the range, the higher the price, right? If you cannot predict well, you will end up paying more or your cargo will not move. So not every carrier and forwarder is able to give you these type of uh, allocations, but if you don't ask, you don't get. So MQC divided by 50 probably is slowly, in my in my opinion, uh, is slowly going to die. It will take a bit of time. Expect carriers to demand subject to contracts more than in the past. What does it mean is the prices you will be receiving from forwarders or carriers in many cases will be subject to PSS or peak season charges, subject to GRI, subject to RRI, it depends on the carrier. So make sure you read your terms and conditions and make sure you understand what your contracts are subject to. And if they are subject to, make sure you understand, is there a ceiling Is there a, or not? Or is it just subject to mutually agreed? And I'm not saying which one is better, it kind of depends on it. every client's unique. It's just, it's important to understand it. Like Lars said, optimize for resilience, uh, plan to move a portion of your freight and premium contracts, maybe by SKU. If some of your SKUs or SKUs is basically the units, right? Like if some of your products are selling better, uh, maybe move them on premium products, maybe even sign a contract using those premium services or premium contracts, right? To make sure that the products that are currently very hot and selling are moving. On the other hand, we saw that some people have too much inventory of some goods. So if those goods are not as important, maybe you can sign lower, cheaper contracts, right? That are maybe subject to role. So like this type of differentiate, differentiation will slowly penetrate the market. I think it will take time. The last thing I'll say here is digital contracts, specific contracts, like I mentioned with allocations, what is it subject to, what isn't it subject to, simply carry more weight. The handshake agreements are not going to cut it. You know, you see what happened in 20 Many of you have had handshakes agreements. They didn't work. So get things in writing uh, and consider digital contracts as they penetrate the market. Any uh, any additions from from you here, Lars, uh, other than the regulations and areas is outlined? The only, the only, I mean, it, it's partially contained here. The one thing I would pay attention to are bunker surcharges. As a shipper, I would brace myself for sharply increasing bunker surcharges during 2021. If the world recovers from the pandemic, that also means the world's energy needs is going to go up rapidly. It takes a bit of time for especially the oil producers to adjust. So you cannot rule out a scenario where crude oil fuel, uh, prices increases rapidly at some point in 2021, which will cause bunker fuel charges to increase and therefore also significant increases in bunker surcharges. Makes sense. We are almost at time. I want to be super respectful of, of, of everyone's uh, time out there. We really, uh, we really value the engagement here. We'll take uh, another another five minutes uh, for, for a few more questions and, and answers. Uh, but if you have other, other commitments, uh, please uh, feel free to drop. Uh, but the ones of you who are interested in staying for another five minutes, we'll uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go on for for a little bit more. Um, Nereus, um, in addition to these recommendations, um, we also did um, quite the interesting analysis uh, recently on some of the trends we're seeing uh, we're seeing out there. Can you can you basically yep. show what, what we're seeing here in this chart? 
Thanks, Anders. And again, apologize, everybody, because I know we're out of time, but I think it's quite insightful. So many people are feeling importers are feeling antsy. If you work with a carrier, you're like, oh, maybe my cargo didn't get loaded. What should I do? Should I include an NVO or a freight forwarder this year or vice versa? So I wanted to share some stats. I ran some stats which show that NVOs or freight forwarders gained significant share in 2020. It doesn't mean that carriers didn't do a good job loading your cargo. It simply means that freight forwarders were able to probably navigate it between the carriers as they were running out of equipment or had blank sailings or whatever else happened in this year. The forwarders were able to snag more capacity and they bought most of the premium services. I shouldn't say most, a lot. A lot of premium services were bought by the freight forwarders. Uh, so I think it's just insightful. Again, take it. Take it with a grain of salt. Again, I'm not saying who did a better job. I think data speaks for itself. Uh, the last thing I shall see here is in 220, importers needed a lot more exceptions, meaning diversions, transloading, because the regular shipping to DC model is not working anymore, right? With e-commerce, you need more, your goods in every single place. So I, I assume that also impacted the forwarder's share in 2020. So it's more of an insight that I wanted to share with you all before the Q&A. Thanks, Nerys. Um, on that note, let's uh, round off with uh, just a couple of questions um, from, uh, from the audience uh, again. Really, really appreciate everyone's engagement. We have seen tons of great questions. We've tried to, to answer a lot of them uh, online, uh, but the ones that haven't been answered yet, we'll definitely make sure that we, uh, we get back to each of you uh, offline. Uh, but let's uh, let's cover just a couple of questions uh, right here uh, for everyone. Uh, one of them being, uh, one of you mentioned the extra capacity of new containers coming online soon. But are you seeing any new orders for ships that would raise any overcapacity issues two to three years out? Lars, you want to no, take a stab at that, that one? That, that, that's, that's the simple question. If you look at the vessels, we are in the beginning part of a of an upcycle in favor of the carriers. Normally, at this point in time, you would see the carriers go hog wild in ordering new capacity on the vessel side. They are not. Sure, we are seeing some ordering of ultra-large vessels, but in the larger scheme of things, it amounts to almost nothing. So right now, we are not seeing the carriers ordering large amounts of vessels, which also means that unless something else happens, we are poised for at least a couple of years, if not three, of gradually increasing upcycle in the market in favor of the carriers. Got it. Thanks, Lars. Let's, uh, let's cover another question here. If the carriers have to blank these uh, sailings for operational uh, reasons in Transpac due to congestion in LA, doesn't that increase the time it'll take to clear out the backlog on the China side of the equation? Lars, do you want to start with this one? Yes, in, indeed. And that's also why I say part of the wild card here in clearing out the backlog and getting equipment back in place is contingent on how quickly can we resolve this port congestion backlog. Because that, that is a critical element. Absolutely, yes. Neeris, how do you see this? you agree? Sorry, it wasn't me. No, actually, I agree with Lars. I think, yeah, I simply agree with Lars. All right, let's take uh, the final question uh, before we round off here. Um, is the port situation today worse than with the Long Beach labor strike a few we, uh, a few years back? Lars, do you want to start? As far as I recall, and this is off the top of my head, uh, I have seen some stats in recent weeks that indicate we do have more ships and they do wait for a longer time now than when we had the debacle back uh, five, six years ago. So it is worse. And it's lasting longer, I would add, that, you know, the, the, while the conditions back then were bad, they lasted for a few months. Now this is lasting for months and it's expected to last for probably a few more months. Yeah, and, and you can say what's different from back then, that was fine. It was a problem in the ports, but this time it also extends to the chassis, to the trucks, to the rail, to the warehouses. It's the entire chain that's impacted this time. Definitely. 
on that note, just want to make sure we don't uh, we don't finish off with a doom and gloom. We did hear quite some uh, quite some uh, sort of uh, glimpse of light at the end of the tunnel uh, throughout the past hour or so. So uh, let's all remain uh, somewhat uh, optimistic. Uh, Lars, Nair, thanks so much for your time. Thanks to everyone who dialed in. Uh, really appreciate the engagement here, all the great questions. We'll make sure we uh, we get back to each of you offline with any, uh, any follow-up answers. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.